On December 17, 2023, parliamentary elections were held in Serbia. Among the various colorful political parties, one in particular stood out. Not by its success, but because of its name, Stolen Babies. A group not characterized by classical left and right political divisions, or a broader desire for power, but rather distinguished by its single goal, anti-trafficking. The organization gathers hundreds of parents from not only Serbia, but also other ex-Yugoslav countries who claim that their newborn babies were abducted from them by an underground trafficking ring that was created sometime in the 1960s and still operates to this day. This is their story, the story of Balkan's most disturbing secret. Over the span of 70 years, hundreds of parents have come forward with chilling claims of their babies being abducted. These incidents happened sporadically and were scattered across former Yugoslavia, persisting even after its dissolution in the 1990s. What is particularly unsettling about these accounts is the striking similarity between them. So rather than examining each case individually, let us delve into this mystery through an illustrative scenario of an archetypal case. Imagine a couple, typically very young, often under the age of 25, hailing from a traditional and economically disadvantaged area of the former Yugoslavia. These couples were usually not highly educated. The husbands were often employed in blue-collar manual labor, much like their wives who, in some instances, were young students. When the woman became pregnant, the couple, aspiring to provide the best for their unborn child, would seek the care of a city doctor in one of the larger urban centers to oversee the pregnancy. The pregnancies, in most cases, progressed smoothly, devoid of complications or indications of any potential health concerns for the baby. However, when the anticipated moment of birth arrived after nine months, peculiar events started to happen. In nearly all instances, the births occurred during the weekends or holidays, almost always at night, times when the hospitals were relatively deserted with only a handful of staff on duty. However, the birth proceeded seamlessly. The newborn entered the world with a healthy cry and the mother would embrace her child for the first time. The infant's well-being was not only affirmed by the doctor's assurance, but also evident from the accounts of every mother present. Subsequently, the baby would be taken to a nursery alongside other newborns, separated from its mother to allow both to rest. However, unbeknownst to her, this separation would mark their final farewell. After a few days or sometimes just hours, the doctor would rush into the mother's hospital room with urgent news. The baby was facing serious complications and needed immediate surgery, often in a larger hospital in another city. The worried mothers would want to go with their baby, However, the doctor would strongly oppose that, as the situation required urgency and the mothers were still recovering from giving birth, so the baby would be taken to the hospital without them for an emergency treatment, a treatment that would ultimately prove fatal. After the surgery, the doctors would inform the parents that their baby had faced complications during the procedure and that it didn't make it. The parents, devastated after the tragic news, then asked if they could see their baby if they could get the body to properly bury it. And this is where the cases got really bizarre. The doctors would inform them that the body was taken care of by the hospital as per usual policy in these cases of death. They were given the death certificate and discharged from the hospital with little to no information on where their child was buried. They searched both the graveyard of the city where the mother gave birth and the city where the baby was rushed for the emergency procedure. In fact, around the time of the baby's death, the graveyards never buried anyone that remotely resembled the deceased child. Furthermore, in many cases, the gender and other physical features of the baby were miswritten in the death certificates. The woman gave birth to a girl, but the death certificate contained that a boy died, the weight was different, and so on. You have to note that these cases began occurring in the 1960s in Yugoslavia, which was a totalitarian society where the system was obviously corrupted and not helpful. In fact, the system, being so scarce with information giving, was clearly protecting someone. Parents who delved deeper into the rabbit hole quickly realized that they were dealing with very powerful and dangerous people. Many were subtly and not so subtly advised to tread lightly moving forward. However, explicit threats weren't always necessary because the community itself gradually extinguished their hope, dismissing them as crazy. Nobody believed them. 
they felt hopeless. Eventually, some parents discovered that their case wasn't isolated, but that it was happening all across the country. They started to form groups and collectively investigate the cases. Over time, they gathered hundreds of testimonies from not only parents, but also hospital staff, nurses, doctors, and policemen. However, even with this evidence, they were still considered crazy until three magical letters entered the equation. D-N-A. Because of technology's progression, some mothers managed to track down their long-lost babies after decades of searching. One such case is that of Mlađen Radivojević, a Serbian man from Kruševac who, after 40 years, discovered he was adopted after being abducted from his biological parents. Suddenly, the parents were no longer considered crazy, and the media began covering the stories more extensively. The organization continued to expose the intricate web of lies and deceit, uncovering the names of certain doctors, lawyers, and members of the intelligence community who were part of this underground network. However, despite decades of testimonies and research, they never fully untangled the sinister web, but they did form a partial conclusion. They believe that the lower tier operatives of the network were certain individuals, doctors, lawyers, policemen, etc., who were chosen for their susceptibility to corruption and their ambitions for higher positions, positions they could attain by following orders. At the top of the operation were rogue members of Yugoslav's intelligence community, at the time the most feared and powerful group in the country. They were the puppet masters behind the abductions, the masterminds of the operation who devised the intricate trafficking network and ultimately sold the babies. The trafficking ring targeted young, inexperienced and poor couples from rural parts of Yugoslavia, people who had no means or power to uncover the truth. After the abduction, the babies were either sold to wealthy parents in Yugoslavia or abroad, often to parents who couldn't conceive their own children. However, in more sinister cases, they were sold to people with darker intentions. The price for the newborns reportedly ranged from tens of thousands of dollars upwards, depending on the buyer and the purpose. The Stolen Babies Group estimates that between 1960 and early 2000s, around 500,000 babies were abducted. And although there are fewer cases of baby abductions, they are still happening to this day. Because of all these reasons, the parents decided they should participate in the elections, grasping for a slice of power that would give them a chance to find their long-lost children and to prevent the trafficking from continuing. Their election results, however, proved that despite all of their struggles, society still wasn't very interested in their battle. A lot of these parents are now in the twilight of their lives tired of decades of traversing the cold corridors of human darkness, searching for someone they love most in the world. But one thing these parents couldn't be deprived of, one thing they never lost, was hope.